eyes can satisfy And here I stand to testify And I have crossed the oceans wide And only Christ can satisfy I have won, sing it out And I have wandered many roads Many empty ones indeed But like a flood your love has come And now my joy is found in me And oh, just to say Sing this verse with me, with a breath. And with a breath it all begins. With one final, not the end. And I will join that total strong with the unending glorious song. Here goes him. And oh, just to say. That you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head of my enemy. You come back and you call it my victory. You've even gone to win my war. Your love becomes my greatest defense. It leads me from the dry wilderness. And all I did was praise. All I did was All I 
Good morning, Grace Fellowship. Welcome to an incredible Sunday morning. Look how beautiful it is out here. The sun's rising, the worship band is rehearsing. It's gonna be an awesome day. Hey, today we're gonna to be studying Matthew 14, uh, where Jesus feeds the 5,000. Fun fact, did you know that Jesus feeding the 5,000 is the only miracle that's recorded in all four gospels? Hey, also just a reminder that today, after second service, we're gonna have baptism. So if you're signed up for that, get on up here. Today I'll be hanging out at North Campus and in the chat box. So let me know if you need anything and God bless.
That's what I'm talking about. Well, hey, just a quick housekeeping item. Um, many of you know Tyler Moffat. Today's his birthday. Uh, so, so for greeting time, we're all just going to find Tyler and tell him happy birthday. Yes. Just kidding. Hey, would you guys take just a few minutes, turn, say hey to someone, let them know they're in the right spot this morning.
the fears I've held, you have spoken over suffering, over past regrets, over sin. worship you together, Father. I just thank you that in the craziness of life, Lord, you are the constant. You are the rock, Lord. You are our firm foundation. Um, and there's nothing um, that the enemy can do um, to take that away from us, Lord. Everything around me is shaken. I 
today. It's um, taken right, right out of scripture in Psalm 148, verse 1 and 2, the whole chapter. It says, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him, all ye angels, all heavenly hosts, all celestial bodies, creatures. And it goes down to verse 13 and says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. So please join us and sing as we praise this God, this amazing God. His name is worthy to be praised. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above heavenly. yourself and there is no one like you we're so grateful this morning that you are the same today when we woke up as you were yesterday as you were from the very beginning as you will be until the end you are alpha omega you are worthy of all praise and somehow lord you are so great you are so infinite you are so other and yet in your word jesus says me and my father we will come and we will make our home in you. Oh, Jesus, let that impact us fresh and new this morning. That you've come to make your home in us. That we might make our home in you. What a gift. What a beautiful thing. We love you, Lord. You can go ahead and have a seat if you haven't done so already. We just want to keep going in this prayerful, worshipful atmosphere where God is obviously moving there's peace and there's power in this place this morning and that's something to celebrate as a family right well you will have one of these cards either to your left or to your right in the seat back in front of you um, and this card is our connection card and we'd love for you to fill it out on the back you can hand write a prayer request we do prayer requests a few different ways but there's something really special and, and intentional about handwriting down a prayer request 
And so we want you to know you can do that now. Maybe you've already done that, but you also have the whole service. There's boxes in the back where you can place this prayer request. You can even leave them at the altar during our time of prayer. This is between you and the Lord and also a way that we as a family can just come alongside you, pray for you, believe with you for the things you are contending for here in the land of the living. God is good. He answers prayers. And we're here to partner with you in that place of prayer. And then also you'll see in your worship guide this week, one of those prayer requests from last week, someone hand wrote down something they're struggling with or believing for. And I firmly believe that if one brave person had the guts to write it down, there's many of us who are struggling with something similar, or we have a burden for someone we love who is struggling with something similar. So let's just take a moment Hold space for those prayer requests that are written from last week in our worship guide now. Let's go ahead and pray, pray for that. Jesus, we thank you that you are attentive to the needs of your people, that you say, cast all your anxieties on me, not just because I care about you, I care for you in real tangible ways. And so Lord, we're asking on behalf of our brothers and sisters that you would be big in each and every situation, whether people are dealing with great tragedy or they are approaching great triumph. Lord, would your presence permeate all of these circumstances that we're bringing before you this morning. We thank you that your word says, consider the sparrow, consider the lily. Your father provides for all of their needs. Why wouldn't he provide for you? And I love the song we sang today. He's never failed. We've built our lives in you, Jesus. Why would you fail now? You won't, we believe you. So Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we just ask that belief would well up inside of our hearts as individuals and then it would Fill this room as we sit together thinking the one thing, Jesus is worthy and he is here, that you would come and do a ministry only you can do, Lord. And we recognize that there are needs outside of us that are so great, it's almost hard to approach you in prayer, Lord, because we don't have the answers. We don't have the answers for what goes on in Russia and Ukraine. We don't have the answers for what's going on in the Middle East, Lord, but we know that we can approach you and pray according to your will in your word. In the prayer of David in Psalm 122, it says, ask heaven to grant peace to Jerusalem. May those who love you prosper. Oh, Jerusalem, may his peace fill this entire city. May this citadel be quiet and at ease. It's because of people, King David says, my family, my friends, even my acquaintances that I say may peace permeate you. And because the house of the eternal one, our God is here, know this, I will always seek your good. So we agree, Lord, with scripture. We agree with David and we, in obedience, come before you and ask for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you for being attentive to our prayers, Lord. Thank you for caring for us not just about us. Come and have your way in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. As the offering comes, you can drop your prayer request in that bag, or again, you can drop it in the box in the back. Leave it at the altar. Just take your time. All right, well, good morning to you. Thanks for being there. Thank you. Thank you for those who are wishing me happy birthday. I feel so loved in this place. Nowhere else I'd rather be on my birthday than here. 
You know, I was telling a couple of people uh, before, April 14th is known, so that's today, in case you're wondering, uh, it's known in history as the worst day in history. No joke. Abraham Lincoln was shot, the Titanic sank, and World War I started all on April 14th. So we're trying to reverse that, amen? We're going to make it a little different. Hey, if you have a Bible, if you'll uh, open your Bible to the book of Matthew, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14 today as we're in a series right now called Restore the Table, where we're looking at what does the Bible have to say about having meaningful mealtimes together. And if you've been following along with us the past couple weeks, you've seen that we've issued this 40-day challenge that uh, in Jim Leggett words, we're double dog, triple dog daring you to do with your loved ones, which is to spend five meaningful meals per week together with the people that you love. And then over the course of 40 days to three times invite someone outside your circle into your home, into your table to have some meal times together. And we've encouraged you to use the hashtag restore the table and post some pictures so we can celebrate. And we have some that are just kind of going to be rolling that you guys have shared. And uh, it's just so cool to watch what's happening in your tables that we're going, hey, you know, really our nation can change when we invite people in to our table. So I'd encourage you, yeah, there's some munchkins up there, uh, to, to post a picture this week to invite people into your table and we can change the world that way. It's awesome. All right, well, this morning we're talking about multiplying the table. And uh, I want to start with this story. I, I uh, Growing up, I always played football. I've talked about that before. We were a football family, and, and I played it. And in Texas, football's a big deal, amen, right? And uh, so I, I, was, I grew up here in Katy, played K, KY, uh, Katy Youth Football, uh, KYF, and then uh, went to Beckendorf and played at Beckendorf and then went to Seven Lakes High School, which just won back-to-back -back state championships in soccer. I mean, I'm just excited for that, us Seven Lakes people. But uh, I, I, I ended up playing football at Seven Lakes, and my junior year, I'm not that big of a guy, but somehow got to start on varsity my junior year. And we had a pretty good year. Uh, we went to playoffs for the first time. There was a lot of excitement for my senior year. But the summer before my senior year, I started to have these weird feelings. And I remember one of the thoughts that I had in my head was, I think I fear my football coaches more than I fear God. And uh, I remember early on just kind of not thinking too much of it, but I couldn't shake it. And I remember, I remember one night, I'll never forget, being kneeling by my bed, just praying and feeling, not audible voice, but feeling like I heard God say, if I told you, Tyler, to quit football, would you do it? And some of you who know Texas 5A at the time football, the thought that the initial response right back was, no way. I'm a leader on the team. I, I'm, I'm coming back as a starter, captain. I, I, there's no way. I don't even think it's allowed. Like, they won't let me. There's no way. And it was as though God said, okay, I know who your God is. I know who you fear most. And this conviction just washed over me. I remember going and talking to my parents and kind of discussing it with them and reaching out to some mentors and realizing Isaac needs to be put on the altar. There's something that I love most in my life that I fear most. And I remember the next day going and talking to my defensive coordinator at Seven Lakes and ta telling him, hey, I, I fear you, looking him in the eyes and saying, I fear you more than I fear God, and I'm not comfortable with that. And so I don't think I'm supposed to play this next year. <laughs> and he was shocked, absolutely shocked. Talked to another coach, shocked. Talked to a bunch of the coaches. Everyone was shocked except one coach. I remember just me and him sat down in this room and he looked me in the eye and he said, you know what, I wish I had the courage to do what you're doing right now. I like, what? Kept talking to the coaches for four hours and eventually my conviction won out. And I said, no, I'm not supposed to play and went home with no plan, just with open hands. God, I don't know what, it was supposed, what I'm supposed to do next. Next day, I get an email from our teaching pastor here at Grace, Paul Helbig, who I've talked about a lot out of the blue, who emails me, Tyler, I've been praying for you, and I feel like I'm supposed to mentor you this year, but I know you have football, so we can work around that. I email him back, no way, Paul. 
I've got tons of time. I'm not playing football this year. She said, all right, let's meet up today. We met up, and he designed a year-long internship for me here at Grace that culminated with me my senior year speaking on this stage on Senior Sunday preaching that changed the trajectory of my life. And I look back now as the teaching pastor here and go, wow, God, I can see what you were doing. But there's one other thing that happened. A few years after uh, I quit my senior year, a couple years after that, I got a Facebook message from one of the coaches at Seven Lakes. And uh, this was the coach who had made the courage comment a couple years earlier. And I found out he had moved on. He had uh, lived in a different city and got out of coaching to spend more time with his family. And he wrote this to me on Facebook. He said, hey there, Mr. Moffat, I had the opportunity to go on a church retreat this past weekend. Never done that before. I gained an understanding of how you always remain so positive in high school. I think that I, at 38, finally found God. It's amazing. The best I've felt in years. Not sure why I needed to tell you that, but you crossed my mind a few times while I was there. I wish you the best. Thanks for being a younger role model for me. And I remember getting that and going, God, I can see it now. I can see it now. Back then, I couldn't. It was just this sacrifice of, I think I'm supposed to do this. But now, teaching Pastor at Grace, watching what happened, I can see it. This morning, we're going to watch Jesus go against everyone's assumptions of what he was supposed to do. And provide for people in a miraculous, supernatural way that only he can do. And he's going to blow everyone's mind. And that's what we're going to study together in Matthew 14. Let me pray for us and we'll dive in. Father, thank you for this time and thank you for today. And God, like Sam just prayed, Lord, our hearts just break and there's even fear and anxiety as we look at what's happening right now in the Middle East. And it just feels like it's one thing after another and yet to see bombs, missiles, drones coming over Jerusalem, you think, wow, Lord, we just know nothing surprises you. It surprises us, it doesn't surprise you. So we just release control. We trust you. We ask your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God, may we this morning not have a frivolous talk, but may this make sense in light of what's happening over the world and in light of eternity. We long to encounter you, a risen God. Oh God, come, be here. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Matthew 14, little background on the passage we're reading. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, had just died. He'd just been murdered by Herod. And uh, we're going to watch Jesus' response to that in Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 13. We'll read this passage together. Matthew 14, verse 13 says, Now when Jesus heard this, heard that John had been murdered, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. Verse 14. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they, ate all, they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up the 12 baskets full, the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Stop there. So in this section, we're going to watch Jesus do three things in the feeding of the 5,000. The first thing we see Jesus do is, number one, Jesus empathizes with people. Jesus empathizes with people. Look again at verse 13. It says, now when Jesus heard this, that John the Baptist had died, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Stop there. So remember the context. Jesus just found out that his cousin, 
His loved one, someone who he deeply loved, had just been murdered. And what does Jesus do? He withdraws and wants to get some space alone by himself to mourn. He gets on a boat, he goes to a desolate place, and he's mourning the loss of a loved one. Many of us have been in this place that Jesus is feeling right here. He needs some space. And yet we find out that the crowds see him leaving and chase him. They go after his alone time and they, they're, they're coming to him with all of their problems, right? Which at, at, at best is annoying, but at worst is rude and inconsiderate. Give Jesus a little space. And yet what does Jesus do in verse 14? He sees the crowd and he runs away and he hides and he chastises them. No, he has compassion on them and he heals them. He empathizes with their pain and he cares for them. To empathize means to understand and share the feelings of another. So think about, we'll just stop here for a second and think of some takeaways for us. Takeaway number one, in light of what we just read, if you are in pain today, if you walked in and you're experiencing pain, think about this. Jesus empathizes with your pain. He doesn't just care about your pain while sitting in heaven going, oh, that must be so sad. He gets it. He understands your pain. He's felt the loss of a loved one before. He's wanted some space away from people. Amen, moms who are at home, you need a little space away from your crazies. He needs a little space. And he's going, I just need to be alone. And Jesus gets it. He understands This is what makes Christianity better than every other religion on the planet. It's not against them. It's just going, our God has felt our pain. He entered into it. He doesn't just see it. He gets it. And so we've been having these table talk questions for you to take and around your table this week to ask these questions. Here's table talk number one. What pain are you currently experiencing? Or where have you experienced pain in the past? Maybe around your table, you can get really real. Man, this is the pain that I'm experiencing right now. And how does Jesus empathize with that pain? But there's a second takeaway that I think we get from these first two verses. And it's the question, this question. How do you react when you're interrupted? How do you react when you're interrupted? Do you pout and complain? Oh, I never get any time for myself. Will you people just deal with your own problems for a second? Let me deal with mine. Or do you care like Jesus did? So I'm Tyler. I'll go first, okay? Uh, I'm an extroverted person. I am. I love being around people. But I love alone time. I do. I love alone time. It's why I get up at 4.45 in the morning because I want to be alone. I got to find the one time when no one else will be around. And yet having three young kids kind of puts a wrench into that plan sometimes. And uh, so early in the morning, I'm trying to spit, get my coffee, spend some time alone with Jesus just uh, in silence. And Malachi, our little 10-month-old, has decided, I want to spend some alone time with you, with Jesus. And I'm like, ah, and you know, it's funny. I'm a pastor, okay? I'm supposed to love my kids, you know? But when I hear <laughs> that cry start, There's something in me that just goes, no, you know, you buddy, not now. And I've had to fight to rather than turn interruption into frustration, turn interruption into invitation. And to go in there with the little guy and grab him, you know, like, all right, me and you. And sit him in his high chair and put some Cheerios and give him his book and take my Bible and turn that into a moment. I think we have a picture that we just share this moment together, right? My wife and I, Jen, we uh, have decided we're doing P90X together. Remember P90X from 20 years ago? The little uh, videos that you put in, your DVD, your VHS player. Well, we're doing it. And uh, we do it at 6 a.m. And Malachi said, I want to be a part of that. So we've been frustrated. Instead, we set up his pack and play in our garage. And we said, Malachi, you're our uh, personal trainer. And he just yells at us the whole time while we work out. How, how do you handle interruption in your life? This is kind of funny, but I mean, I'm just very, very much. When it's my alone time that I've carved out, my wife knows. I cherish that. I don't like getting interrupted. 
But Jesus, we just watch him turn interruption into invitation. Where in your life does, is God asking you to grow in empathy for your kids or your spouse or your coworkers or your neighbors or, or the people in your school or the PTA or the whatever it is that you just go, would you get off my back? And instead go, all right, how can I turn this into invitation in my life? The first thing that we see Jesus do in Matthew 14 is empathize with people. He empathizes with them. But then the story continues and we see Jesus do something else. The second thing we see Jesus do is Jesus challenges assumptions. Jesus challenges assumptions. Look at Matthew chapter 14. We're going to pick it up in verse 15. It says, now when it was evening, so it had been all day of him healing people, the disciples came to him uh, and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Verse 16, but Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Stop there. So the disciples come up to Jesus and they're just thinking pragmatically. And they give two uh, facts right at the beginning. They say, this place is desolate and it's getting dark. And in light of those two facts, it's, it's not that we're being heartless. It's just, this is the assumption. The crowds need to be sent away to go get something to eat. We don't have enough. It's getting dark. It's desolate. Send them away, Jesus. We've done enough good for the day. And Jesus comes back challenging this assumption. Jesus says, no, they don't have to go away. And then he gives them a new solution. You give them something to eat. I mean, think about how bold that is. They come saying, hey, it's time, Jesus. This is great. Great day. Check it off. I'd say this was a win. And he goes, "Ah, no, they don't have to go away. You give them something to eat. Logically, something impossible that Jesus is testing their faith right now. It's interesting. In chapter 13, the chapter before, Jesus had just given about seven parables teaching them. Teaching, teaching, teaching about the kingdom of God, about putting your faith in Jesus. And then in chapter 14, if if chapter 13 is the lecture, chapter 14 is the test. Will you do it? And and I've been really hanging out on the phrase that Jesus says, they need not go away. They need not go away. In fact, Charles Spurgeon, the great British pastor, preacher from the 1800s, had a whole sermon just over this phrase, they need not go away. And the deeper I've thought about that phrase, the more profound it has become. Here's the reality. With God, our assumptions don't have to become reality. The things we think have to be true in light of the facts that we see don't have to become reality. Why? Because God can do the impossible. He can. I thought about my dad, who I've talked about a lot. But my dad grew up uh, without a dad. My dad's dad died when he was a couple months old in a car accident. And he was the youngest of four kids. And his mom never remarried. And, uh, you know, my, I always just took that for granted growing up. I just, oh, yeah, of course, I never had a grandpa, and uh, my dad never really grew up with a dad. But the, the older I got, the more I thought about the statistics of what should have been true of my dad. In fact, I just looked them up. The National Fatherhood Initiative says that in the home where the father is not present, which many of us have experienced, there's a greater risk of poverty. There's, you're more likely to commit a crime or go to prison more likely to abuse drugs or alcohol, more likely to suffer from obesity, more likely to drop out of school, and more likely to get divorced yourself or grow up as an absent father. So that's a way my dad could have gone. It's a way. But God said over my dad, that's not my way. That's a way, but it's not my way. I started to think about my dad imperfect, very imperfect, but has been faithful to my mom for over 30 years. Raised five kids who imperfectly, but love Jesus. Works out every day. Ended up going to school, finishing school, and getting his MBA. Has never been to prison, as far as I know. I mean, there's a way. And then God said, no, you don't have to go that way. Think about This just takes our statistics and our stereotypes and it blows them up. You don't have to go a way. You can go my way. 
So, some of you have lived under statistics for a long time. You've lived under stereotypes for a long time. And where is God calling you to break out of those assumptions about your life or others? Table talk number three, where have you had assumptions about other people? And where is God calling you to break out of those assumptions? Because doesn't God tend to knock those walls down? I mean, he just does. I think maybe some of us have a neighbor in our neighborhood that's just a grouch, right? Some of you have that neighbor that's just a grouch. And you tried, you took cookies over that one time, you saw him at the mailbox, and just, just a grouch. And you can decide that's just who they are. It's just the stereotype is true, grouchy neighbor. Or, okay, God, you may be doing something else in their life. You may have me living next to them for a purpose. And so, yeah, there's a way, but maybe your way is different. And so you continue to love them, and you continue to show up, and you continue to invite them. And maybe over this series, that neighbor who you can't stand, God's saying, let them be one of your three. And you're going, no, not them. The, the family that has all the kids, we want them, not grouchy Ed. No, right? And yet maybe God's saying, I'm doing something in him. Maybe it's a coworker that never talks, never talks, never smiles. And yet you see it as a challenge rather than a threat, a challenge. No, I'm going to get them to smile. It's going to happen, right? And you start inviting them to lunch and, and uh, reaching out and stopping by their office and talking to them. Maybe it's your view of the next generation, right? You look at Gen Z or Alpha or Millennials and you go, no, nah, they're just all addicted to their phones. They're all addicted. It's a wash. And yet, maybe God's going to spark a revival out of a remnant from this next generation of saturated with social media and their phones that he's going to raise up a remnant from them. And so rather than going, oh, it's all a wash, you start praying for that remnant. God, raise up some who will go after your way, not the culture's way. Maybe it's generational sin in your family That everyone in your family maybe has had an alcohol addiction. And you go, that's the way of my family. Everybody goes that way. But that's not God's way. And I'm not going that way. I don't have to follow that assumption. I don't have to go away. I can go God's way. Or pornography. Or gossiping. Or my family's just full of drama. So, yeah, I guess, spouse, this is what you married. This is who we are. That's maybe what it is. But you go, no, we're going to be different. We're not going to go that way. We're going to go this way. What is it? With God, our assumptions don't have to become reality because God can do the impossible. Are you trusting him for anything in your life instead of believing the stereotypes and statistics going, I want to follow God's way? You can do the impossible. We see that Jesus empathizes with people. Jesus uh, challenges assumptions. And then number three, Jesus multiplies what we only have. Jesus multiplies what we only have. Let's pick it up in verse 17. We'll read that, the rest. Then they, the disciples, said to Jesus, We have only, or we only have, five loaves here and two fish. And Jesus said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish... He looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And then they took up the 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So the disciples come to Jesus and they change the tone a little and they say, hey, look, we only have five loaves and two fish. This is all we got. And we find out in John chapter 6 that it's not even theirs. They got it from a little boy's lunch. And yet Jesus says, you know what? That'll work. I can use that. And Jesus has everyone sit down, and then he blesses the food, and he breaks the bread, which is a nod to the Lord's Supper, and he begins to pass it out, and this food begins to multiply. And this, this food, these five loaves and two fish, end up being enough to feed and fill 5,000 men, not counting women and children, upwards of 15,000 to 20,000 people from five loaves and two fish. And we see at the end, there's 12 baskets full left over. 
So here's the takeaway. Jesus can use what we only have, no matter how small. And when we trust Jesus with our simple obedience, he can multiply what we give to him. I thought about uh, in 2020, I was a youth pastor up in Tennessee. And we were all excited because I had gotten connected with this guy named Matthew, who is a student at Texas A&M. So, of course, he was a believer. And, uh, but anyway, he loved Jesus, and we were going to have him as an intern. And uh, kidding about that, okay. Johnny Manziel went to A&M. Um, <laughs> but we were excited, and we were going to pay him, and it was going to be great. And, and then 2020, pandemic hit, and the church up in Tennessee said, we're cutting discretionary spending. We're not spending anything other than what we've already been spending. And, and so we can't pay an intern. And just we were so bummed. We were so disappointed. And, and, uh, and my wife and I, we, Jen, we just decided, you know what? Okay, we can't pay him, but what if he could live in this house with us? Small little house, but we got an extra room, guest room, and an eight-month-old. You know, we don't have a lot of money. We're kind of living paycheck to paycheck, but maybe we can offer him to live with us. And so I call him, hey, man. We can't pay you, but uh, you can live with me and my eight-month-old, you know, in our small house for free. And he goes, I'm in. Let's do it. I'm like, okay, you know. And then kind of the fear started of like, how are we going to pay for this? But we're just, let's do it. And so he came in, in May of that year, and absolutely we watched our youth ministry just transform with him coming. Uh, it began to blow up. We did all this stuff outside in the midst of the pandemic, and, and God used it to transform our student ministry. Not only that, Matthew became like a part of our family. We called him Uncle Matthew. Not only that, he ended up uh, going back to AM, meeting this girl. They got married. He asked me to officiate their wedding. I think we have a picture. And, uh, and then they moved to Tennessee, became a part of the church out there. And then now he's a youth pastor in the Dallas area. A couple months ago, he invited me to, to speak to his youth group. And then now he's one of my closest friends. I talked to him for an hour and a half on the phone this weekend. And just thinking, man, God can take that little bit of what we only have. Hey, man, I can't, pay, I can't do what I want, wanted to do, but I can do this. And he can multiply beyond what we thought was possible. Where do you, what do you only have right now that God may be wanting to multiply for his purposes? Table talk number four. Where was a time for you when you sacrificed something you only had out of simple obedience? And what happened to it at the end? Is there anything you only have right now that God may be wanting to multiply for his purposes? I thought about, you know, a lot of times for us, we switch only have with an excuse of if I only had. You know, we use that. If I only had more money, then I would invite people over to my home. And instead, God's saying, no. What if you said, I only have a little bit of money. So I can invite one person over and we're going to eat pizza, okay? Or maybe if I only had a bigger house, then I would let people live with me. Or, I, okay, I only have one room and so one person can live with me for a little bit. Or maybe it's I, if I only had more knowledge, then I could serve with our student ministry or then I could lead a small group. While others of you are saying, okay, I only have a little bit of knowledge, and yet I, I'll, I'm willing, and so I'll put myself out there. Some of you would say, I, if I only had more margin in my life, if there weren't so many events and so many crazy things, then we could gather up as a family. If I only had more margin. And others of you say, I only have 20 minutes. That's all I got. There's craziness. I only have 20 minutes, and yet we are going to prioritize sitting together as a family. We're just going to do it. Some of you say, if I only had more strength, or more energy, if I only had more health, then I would worship Jesus, then I would encourage people. And others of you, and I've seen it, many of you are in this room, say, I only have a little bit of energy. I only have a little bit of health. I only have a little bit of strength. And yet I will use that little bit that I have to worship Jesus. God tends to use our only have to multiply. God loves only have. He loves it. He uses only have, and he multiplies only have. Will you trust Jesus with your simple obedience in your life? 
What is he calling? What's he nudging on you to go, we don't have much, but we have this. And God, help me get rid of the excuses and start simply obeying. I was just hearing someone that was saying, you know, it's very rare. A lot of people will say, I can't give any money right now because I don't have enough. Once I get more money, then I will give. And they did a, a st statistics for like 2,000 people across the country. And the people who give the most are people who make less than $30,000 a year. It's crazy. The people who give the least are the people who give more than 100000 it's just there's something about when we, when we don't have as much and we just go, God, I'm just going to offer what I have right now. It's just little that God tends to use that and multiply it. And it really is more blessed to give, not just of our money, but of our resource and our time and our energy that, that we think, I don't have enough, but I only have this. God can use it and God can multiply it. We see Jesus in this passage. He empathizes with people. He challenges assumptions. He multiplies what we only have. And these are, all of these three things are amazing principles. They're incredible principles we can get from this. But I think there's something else that's roaring under this parable, under this miracle, that is the most important thing. And it's the conclusion of this, that Jesus restores our soul. Jesus restores our soul. There's just half of a verse that we kind of skimmed over that I want to dig deep into now because I think this is the whole point of the passage. And it's Matthew chapter 14, the first half of verse 19. Look at verse 19. It says, then he, Jesus, ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Read that again. Then Jesus ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And then he broke the, lo the loaves and fish and multiplied. It's such interesting wording. Why did Jesus order them to sit down on the grass? You know, you think about a big potluck in someone's backyard. If you're, having, you're grilling something and everyone's in the backyard, what's typically happening? People are in line, they're gathered around, they're standing. It's just very natural. You don't normally go, everybody sit down, right? You're just enjoying. And that could have been, that could have, been the scene, but Jesus said, no, I want everyone to sit down. And it doesn't say he encourages it. He said he orders them to sit down. And I think this was intentional. I think Jesus has in his mind what David wrote back in Psalm 23. Think about what David wrote. Many of us know this passage. When David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. What? What? He leads me beside still waters. In the end, he restores my soul. Jesus is making this crowd lie, he's making them lie down in green pastures. He's in essence saying, I am the only one who can ultimately restore your soul. I'm about to do something crazy and provide this meal in a miraculous way, but here's the reality. You're going to get hungry a few hours from now. This is going to be an amazing moment, but it's not going to be a lasting moment. He said, I, Jesus is saying with this simple phrase, I'm, more, I'm after more than just a transactional meal. I'm after a transformational moment right now with us. Where you see me as the good shepherd who can restore your soul. See, this is the thing about Jesus. We always want to go to him and, and try to get good principles. Oh, what would Jesus do here? What would Jesus do? And Jesus is going, yes, I have good principles. I can nourish you with good principles. But more than that, I want to restore you with my presence. I want to commune with you. I want, you to, I want to force you to lie down and rest, and I be the one who restores your soul. And through Christ's death and resurrection, what we just celebrated a couple weeks ago, this can happen. Hebrews chapter 10 says that we can have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. So that now those of us who are restless and anxious and depressed and struggling can come to Jesus. And he can, the authority of his word, restore our soul. But sometimes he has to force us to lay down in the grass. Hey, I'm about to do that miracle that you're wanting, but I'm after so much more than the miracle. I'm after your soul. I want to restore it my way. 
Oftentimes, our meal times today, this was so interesting in light of the sermon series that we're doing. Our meal times are actually supposed to be a picture of this today. Jim has quoted a stat a couple times in uh, the past two sermons that I have there in your notes, and it's that only 30% of families in America sit down, I kind of added that part, but sit down and eat together regularly. Only 30%. In, in fact, in my small group last week, we, we were going around and we were talking about this stat and we were asking, how many of you grew up in a family where you actually sat down on a regular basis and ate together at the table? I, I want to ask you, how many of you sat down with your family at the table every meal? You know, how many of you? And uh, yeah, a lot of us, and then there's some of us going, no, we didn't. And about half of my small group said, no, we didn't. Every once in a while we did. But we just had a lot going on. We were a sporty family. We, we did all these kind of sports. And so we were running to and fro and grabbing something on the way. Other people said, we just, we, we like to watch sports on TV or we had shows that we like to watch. So we'd gather around in the living room and watch together. Other people said, man, our schedules were all off. I'd just come home late and there'd be hamburger helper there on the stove and I'd heat it up and go to my room and that was pretty much dinner every time. And the reality is these are pragmatic reasons why we don't eat together. They're not evil. But every person in my small group who had that as their story looked back with regret. It wasn't that their families were evil. It wasn't that the the activities were bad. It was that there was something missing when we didn't gather together as a family. Uh, the, the dinner time or meal time just became about the meal rather than about the moment. It, it became about nourishment rather than about uh, enjoying each other's presence. And the truth is, if your family never gathers up together to eat a meal together, you, you're, you're nourishing each other, but you're, not, you're missing a moment and you will regret it, you will. So table talk number five, did your family sit down and eat together around the table growing up? Talk about that, you know, in your family or with your loved ones. And what, if anything, would you want to change about your own family now? As you look and say, man, I, I, I want, some of you are going to have to do what Jesus did to the crowd. I'm going to make you lie down in green pastures. Some of you, it's a battle to get your kids off their phones and to get everyone together at the table. And it's just fighting and stress. And so you've given up. Forget it. Everyone just fight, figure out something to eat. And we'll just work on it. Whatever. And yet some of you, the conviction is, all right, I got to force this again. And not be a jerk, but yet maybe do what Jesus did and say, there's a moment here that we don't want to miss. And actually, Jesus is restoring this moment such that as more of us do it and we invite people in, an outside watching world goes, wow, there's something different about what happens here. And we don't go, oh, here's my principles. We go, Jesus has changed us and made us, made this table a welcoming place where, yeah, there's still strife and fighting, but, uh, but Jesus is our king. And so what is it that what is it that over the course of this message, over the course of this morning, God has been working on you? We're, we're, we're about to open up this prayer altar, and, and we're going to take about five minutes to pray and sing a song of worship together. And so I'd invite you, you know, I've just been back there the past couple weeks, noticing a bunch of us just rush out at the end. And we tried to finish this sermon a little early so that your kids are okay. The traffic's okay, right? We're not Easter crowd. Let's just take five minutes some music playing either up here at the altar or there in your seat. And let's let Jesus restore our soul. Rather than rush, just rest. And what is it that God is working on you? What, what is it that maybe right now in your spirit, you're going, oh man, I feel it. Maybe some of us need to repent of how we're leading our family around the table right now. Maybe that's not happening in your household. And you got a myriad of excuses, really, really good excuses. And yet maybe for some of you, God's gone, try it. Give it 40 days and see if it changes the dynamic of your family. Maybe some of you need to pray, how can I turn interruption into invitation in my life? Maybe some of you need to bring your pain to God this morning. You came in here with pain and the great healer is saying, come to me. I empathize with your pain. I can heal the broken parts of you. I fed 
20,000 people with five loaves and two fish. If I can do that, I can do what's going on in your life. I can. Maybe it's you need Jesus to restore your soul. You're tired and exhausted. You're going, God, I need your restoration. I need you to restore me. Maybe some of you are having the same ping, the same conviction in your spirit that I had my senior year of high school, that there's something in your life. There's a boss in your life. There's a coach in your life. There's a person in your life that you fear more than God. And you don't have the courage to stand up to them. And God's saying, I want you to. Maybe there's a dream in your life or there's a vision that you've had that is killing your family. And you're just fighting for that dream. I got to do it. I got to do it. And God's saying, you need to put Isaac on the altar right now. And yes, I might take it away. But do you believe my ways are better than yours? Or do you have some agenda that you're bringing to this thing? And maybe God's telling you to come up to this altar this morning and lay whatever that thing is down. God, I give football. God, I give whatever it is to you. You're my God, no one else. I fear you alone. Maybe some of you need to become a Christian today. You've been playing the game and you've been waffling back and forth and today's the day. It's time. No more playing around. It's time to give your life fully to Jesus. He's my king. He's my Lord. You know, we're having 25 baptisms after second service. Maybe some of you, you didn't bring a change. Well, your first service, you can go back and get some. But maybe you go, I want to get baptized today. I, I want to put me on the list. I'm all in. What is it that God's doing in your life? There's prayer altars open. You can pray up here or you can pray in your seat. You want someone to pray with you, cup your hands. But come on, church, let's pray. God, we give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray.
sing that together this morning. Let's stand. Say, Lord, we restore me. For there is none like you. No one else can touch my heart. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I can search. God has restored April the 14th. <laughs> yeah, yes. Hey, stay and pray as long as you want. Prayer altar is still available to you. Uh, Tyler's going to be right up front here afterwards if anyone wants to visit. If you're a guest, yeah, Tyler would love just to uh, give you a handshake. Uh, receive this blessing. May the Lord restore your soul. May you feel today the compassion and empathy of our Good Shepherd. May you be granted the grace to turn interruptions into invitation. May the Lord, by the power of His Holy Spirit, shatter the assumptions of our society and even our assumptions and do things we never expected. May the Lord take your only half and multiply it. You're good. And may you lie down in green pastures and have your store with soul. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Have a great week.
Good morning, Grace Fellowship. Welcome to an incredible Sunday morning. Look how beautiful it is out here. The sun's rising. The worship band is rehearsing. It's going to be an awesome day. Hey, today we're going to be studying Matthew 14, uh, where Jesus feeds the 5,000. Fun fact, did you know that Jesus feeding the 5,000 is the only miracle that's recorded in all four Gospels? Hey, also, just a reminder that today, after second service, we're going to have baptism. So if you're signed up for that, get on up here. Today, I'll be hanging out at North Campus and in the chat box. So let me know if you need anything, and God bless. Good morning, church. Should we stand together and worship? Is mighty and 
doing this morning? I'll ask one more time. How are we doing this morning? Doing okay? Very good. Hey, just a quick housekeeping item. We all know we love Tyler Moffat. Today's his birthday. Yeah. So as part of our greeting time, we're all just going to individually get in the line and tell him happy birthday. Just kidding. Um, but seriously, let's take a few minutes, turn, say hey to someone, let them know uh, they're right where they're supposed to be this morning.
Let's just take a moment before we begin and maybe just right where you are and just say, Lord God, uh, I want to be fully present in this time this morning. Take this time. Thank you, Lord, um, that through you and through your blood, we can live again, Lord. I thank you that um, 
through our crazy lives, Lord, you are a firm foundation, Lord. You are the rock, you are constant, you are never leaving us, Lord. I thank you that nothing from this earth can take that away, Lord.
doxology and it's taken right out of scripture from Psalms. So we're looking at Psalms 148 verse 1 and 2. It says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from his heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts. And the verses after that say, the celestial bodies praise him, creatures praise him. And then in 13 it says, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. So let's raise our voices and praise this big God. He's worthy of all our praise. Amen. say thank you as a family. Thank you, thank you, thank you for another Sunday to come together, to sing these words and to believe in our hearts, confess with our mouths and live with our lives that Jesus is Lord. Wow, we love you. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, you can go ahead and have a seat if you haven't already. We just want to continue in this prayerful, worshipful atmosphere as a family and invite you to fill out Something that's super important to us here at Grace, you'll find it in front of you in a seat back pocket or to your left or to your right. It's an information card. We'd love for you to fill that out. And on the other side is a prayer request box. So it's an opportunity for you to just handwrite something you're believing for, something you're, you're asking the Lord for, maybe you're struggling with. And if you are that brave person, I believe fully that there are many of us who are struggling with something very similar. So if you want to take a moment right now, go ahead and write that prayer request in the box. Or if you want to take some time, please do. Maybe something in the sermon is, is what you're going to contend for in prayer this week. We have boxes. As you leave, you can drop those in. Or you can even leave them at the prayer altar. And we'll pray over them and put them in the right spot for you. Um, and if you want to turn in your worship guide, there's a spot where... 
a prayer request from last week that was handwritten out is now printed. And we'd love to just take a moment as brothers and sisters and pray and believe whether it's a great tragedy that they are enduring or a great triumph that they're experiencing and anywhere in between, let's just take a moment and agree in prayer with our brothers and sisters, the prayer request in our worship guide. we thank you that you don't fail. You've never been late. You've never lost a battle. Never once. Never once. You are the overcoming king. And so we just submit all of our prayer requests to you this morning, Lord, as the one who has already overcome the world, who said in the world, you will have trouble, but don't worry. I've overcome the world and I've given you a peace that the world cannot give and therefore the world cannot take it away. So Lord, we just settle into belief this morning and you being who you say you are, you doing what you say that you'll do, bringing a peculiar peace to your people, even in the midst of whatever circumstances going on. And Lord, we cannot forget what's taking place across the world. So according to your word, we pray and we ask for the peace of Jerusalem. King David wrote these words in Psalm 122, and he says, ask heaven to grant peace to Jerusalem. May those who love you prosper. Oh, Jerusalem, may his peace fill this entire city. May this citadel be quiet and at ease. It's because of people, my family, my friends, even my acquaintances that I say, may peace permeate you. And because the house of the eternal one, our God is there, know this. I will always seek your good. So Lord, in obedience and humility, we come and say, grant peace to the holy city, Jerusalem, Lord. We cannot begin to understand the ins and outs of, of this turmoil, but we know you are still the overcoming king. You are the one who sits above it all and you have a plan and we believe your plan is good. So we pray according to your word for the peace of Jerusalem in Jesus' name. As the offering comes, you can drop your prayer request and your gifts or your tithes in there, or you can wait until the end of service. Just take your time, write on that prayer request between you and the Lord. All right, well, good morning to you. Uh, well, thank you to those of you who have wished me happy birthday. I appreciate that. I, uh, I was joking with some people earlier, so today's April 14th, in, in case you don't know. And uh, April 14th is, is my birthday, but it's also been voted by historians as the worst day in human history. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, someone mentioned that to me a few years ago. I said, thank you. I appreciate it. But Abraham Lincoln was shot, World War I started, and the Titanic sank all on April 14th. So we're working to change that trend, right? Amen? Okay. Uh, well, we're going to start by diving into God's Word this morning. Hey, if you have a Bible, if you'll turn to the book of Matthew, first book of the New Testament, and we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14 today. And then if you grabbed a worship guide, you can turn to the uh, sermon notes page and follow along. Well, we're in a series right now called Restore the Table, where we're taking uh, five Sundays to walk through what the Bible has to say about meaningful mealtimes. And we've issued this challenge, if you've been with us, a 40-day challenge to uh, five days a week spend 
a meal time, a meaningful meal time with the people that you love, and then three times over the course of these 40 days to invite someone outside of your circle to come and have dinner with you uh, and your loved ones. And uh, so we, we also have encouraged you as you do this, hey, take a selfie. We're not bragging on ourselves. We just want to watch, you know, how this happens and use the hashtag restore the table. And so I think we've got some pictures of those of you who've done it. And uh, hopefully we'll have some more. Hopefully this week we just get to celebrate in uh, different things that have gone down as we are restoring the table uh, together. And uh, I, in the words of Jim Leggett, I double dog dare you to get involved. You can do it. And uh, even if you, you haven't jumped on the 40 days yet, today can be day one and you can jump in with us. So this morning we're going to talk about uh, multiplying the table, multiplying the table. We're going to get to Mark 14 here in a second. Uh, well, growing up, and I've talked about this before, but uh, me and my brothers, we all played football growing up here in Texas. And so it's a pretty big deal, football in Texas. And, and I grew up here in Katy, so I did KYF football. I was the Texans back when I was a little guy. And then I went to Beckendorf Junior High and, and played football there. And then I went to Seven Lakes High School and played football at Seven Lakes, which side note, Seven Lakes just won back-to-back -back state championships in soccer, which we're really excited about us Spartans, uh, but well, I'll move on. Uh, but Seven Lakes, uh, my junior year, I'm not a very big guy, but somehow, God's providence, I started on varsity my, my junior year. And we went to uh, playoffs that year for the first time. We actually had a semi-good year, and so there was a lot of anticipation for my senior year. We spent all... all uh, spring and summer getting ready. And then in the summer, I got this weird feeling, kind of like this ping in my spirit that I fear the coaches, my football coaches, more than I fear God, truly. And uh, I remember having that thought and kind of brushing it aside, and then it just continued to well up in me. I fear my football coaches more than I fear God. And I remember one day over the summer, I was just kneeling next to my bed, praying, and I felt like God said, just not audible voice, just in my spirit, I felt like God said, if I told you to quit football, would you do it? Now, those of you who know Texas 5A at the time, football, varsity, you don't do that. You don't do that. When, when you're a leader on the team, you've been pouring into the younger guys. Captain, I don't even think it's allowed, right? So I just said, absolutely not, no. And it was as though, I just remember it like yesterday, it was as though God said, all right, I know who your God is. I know who you fear most. And I remember praying there going, God, ah, the pain of, I don't know, you know, like, I'm not a quitter. And uh, taking this to my parents and, and talking it out with them and then talking with some mentors and praying and just feeling this overwhelming conviction that I was supposed to do this. So the next day I wake up and I go talk to my defensive coordinator and he's absolutely shocked. And I just said, coach, I need you to know I fear you more than I fear God. And I'm not comfortable with that. And I talked to another coach and another coach and all of them shocked, shocked. And I finally one coach walked in, I'll just never forget. He, just he and I in this room and uh, I told him and he said, Tyler, I wish I had the courage to do what you're doing right now. I'm like, what? So then I keep talking, four hours of talking to the coaches, and then finally I leave. No plan. That was it. The next day I get an email out of the blue from our teaching pastor here at Grace Fellowship, Paul Helbig, who I've talked about before. And this is what his email says. He said, hey, Tyler, been, you're, you've been on my mind a lot, and I feel like I'm supposed to mentor you your senior year, but I know you have football, so maybe we can work around that. And I email back, Paul, I don't have football. You can mentor me. He said, well, let's meet today. And we met up, and we planned out this whole year-long internship for me at Grace Fellowship to get every facet of ministry. It was amazing. It culminated with me preaching as a senior in high school on this stage on Senior Sunday that changed the trajectory of my life, totally. One other part of this story, though, that is so crazy is a few years after I made that decision my senior year, I got a Facebook message from one of my football coaches. In fact, it was the guy who made the courage comment. 
And he said this. He, I found out he had left coaching to spend more time with his family, moved to a different city, and, and his message said this. Hey there, Mr. Moffat. I had the opportunity to go on a church retreat this weekend. Never done that before. I gained an understanding of how you always remain so positive in high school. I think that I, at 38, finally found God. It's amazing. It's the best I've felt in years. Not sure, I, not sure why I needed to tell you that, but you crossed my mind a few times while I was there. I wish you the best. Thanks for being a younger role model for me. Now, I, I, it's been a few years since I've seen this guy, but I remember... I remember where I was sitting when I got that text message and it was like everything made sense. All the pain of, that, of my senior year made sense in light of, and then moving here and becoming a teaching pastor at Grace going, God, you could see what I couldn't see. See, what we're looking at in Matthew 14 is where Jesus is going to go against everyone's assumptions at what should happen. And he's going to provide for the needs of the people in a supernatural way that no one saw coming, no one. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to dig into this text together. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are a miracle worker, that you can see outside of time. You can see things we can't see. And so right now, even as we walk into this room, with who knows what's going on? God, you know. You're not surprised. So we bring them to you. And God, we bring, as Sam prayed, the Middle East to you. We bring Jerusalem to you. We bring the unrest. And we ask, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We long for you. And we long to meet with you right now in this time. Do whatever you want. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Matthew chapter 14. A little background on Matthew 14, the passage we're reading today. John the Baptist, who is Jesus' cousin, has just been murdered by King Herod. And Jesus finds out about the murder of his cousin, and that's the passage that we're going to look at, his response in Matthew 14. So go to Matthew 14, starting in verse 13. We're going to pick it up there. It says, Now when Jesus heard this, that John had been killed, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place. The day is now over. Send the crowds away into the village, to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Amazing story. We're going to unpack it. And we're going to see in this section, Jesus is going to do three things that we're going to look at together. The first thing that Jesus does in Matthew 14 is he empathizes with people. Jesus empathizes with people. Let's look again at Matthew 14, 13. Look at this. So it says, Now when Jesus heard this, again, that John had been killed, he withdrew from there in a boat, to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Stop there. So remember the context. John's just been killed, and Jesus, when he hears about it, needs to get alone by himself. I think this is an incredibly human moment that we're seeing with Jesus. His cousin... Someone he loves has just been murdered, and Jesus says, I got to go to a desolate place, and I got to be alone. I need a little space. I need to mourn over my loved one, my cousin who I loved. And, and Jesus, much like us, has mourned over the death of someone he loves. But then the crowd sees him leaving, and they follow him. And they go, oh, what about us? What about us? And, and Jesus is interrupted. This moment of mourning and alone time is interrupted by these crowds, 
which at best is annoying, you know, and at worst is just inconsiderate and rude. I mean, let the guy mourn. And what does Jesus do in response in verse 14? He sees the crowd and he runs away and he hides and he chastises them. No, he has compassion on them and he heals them. Jesus empathized with their pain and he cared for them. To empathize means to understand and share the feelings of another. Jesus didn't just care, he, he empathized, which gives some takeaways for us. Takeaway number one, just in these first two verses, takeaway one, if you're in pain, if you've walked in and you're feeling pain and anxiety and struggle and you're hurting over the loss of someone, Jesus, think about this, Jesus empathizes with you. He doesn't just care. He's not just in heaven caring for you. He understands. He knows the loss of a person that he loved. He knows wanting to get some space away from people. Some of you moms who just go, I just need some time away from these crazy kids. Jesus gets it. He understands. And he's entered in. This is why our God is better than all the other religions. And that's not a prideful statement. That is just saying, look, our God didn't just... And create everything, he entered into his creation and he feels what we feel. He knows what it's like. He gets us. So the first table talk in these messages, we want to encourage you. Five meals every week where you're gathered around the people you love. Here's some things to talk about. Table talk number one. What pain are you currently experiencing right now? You know, sometimes we get around the table and it's just superficial. How was your day? Good. How was your day? Good. And maybe one of you would take the initial step and go, hey, guys, can I just be honest? I'm really hurting about this relationship falling apart, about this pain and sickness in my life, about th what, th what happened at work that's just hard. Can I just bring that here? And maybe you would start by just what pain are you experiencing or what have you experienced in the past? And how does Jesus empathize with that pain? We see Jesus empathize, but also take away number two, a question how do you react when you're interrupted? How do you react when you're interrupted? Do you pout and complain when you had an agenda of how the evening was going to go and it gets interrupted and you go, oh, I never get any time for myself and you blame everybody else? Or do you care? You know, I, my name's Tyler and I'll go first. Uh, I, I'm an extrovert. I love being around people, but I love alone time. I love alone time. In fact, I became a morning person over time so that I could get up at 4.45 in the morning and get one hour of all by myself. That's just what I want. I live for it. My coffee, the word, and quiet. And having three young kids just kind of throws a wrench into that plan. In fact, uh, Malachi, my 10-month-old, uh, has decided he wants to share in my alone time at 4.45. And, uh, and so he wakes up with me. And, and again, I, I'm a pastor. I love my kids. But when I hear him start to, you know, in the room, I wish I could say, I just go, oh, my, my son. But I anger. I'm like, oh, no, you could have slept more. Why? And, uh, but I've had to learn how to turn interruption from frustration into invitation, into going, all right, buddy, you're entering into this alone time with me. We get some Cheerios, we're going to get your book, and we're going to do this thing together. I think we have a picture of how the past couple mornings have been of him just eating his Cheerios and, and uh, having life chats there at the kitchen table. Jen and I have been trying to do P90X together. Anybody remember P90X? Okay, it's like 20 years old, VHS tapes. Uh, and, uh, but we're like, we're going to do it. And uh, we're two weeks in. And again, Malachi keeps waking up and interrupting our morning workout. So we said, all right, you're, you're coming. We put his pack and play in our garage. And he yells at us. And he, uh, you know, is our personal trainer there in the garage. And we're like, all right, you're in, buddy. And... Uh, and it's a blast. It's really fun. But I, where are you? I mean, these are kind of silly, but where does interruption come into your life? And just like any of us, we're human beings. It, it comes and we go, ah, oh, I just wanted some alone time. And where is God inviting you to turn interruption into invitation in your life? 
Do you, are, are people annoying and, and just a means to an end to you? Or do you see like Jesus did? Their hurts, their pains, have compassion on them, empathize with them, and care. Jesus was amazing at that, even in a hard, difficult moment of life. And what about you? The first thing, first couple of verses that we see is that Jesus empathizes with people. But then we keep going and we see that Jesus challenges assumptions. Jesus challenges assumptions. Let's pick it up in verse 15. Matthew 14, verse 15. It says, now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. We'll stop there. So the disciples here are thinking pragmatically. And they come to Jesus with two facts. First, they go, hey, Jesus, we're in a desolate place, far away from any restaurants, okay? And number two, it's getting dark. And so based on those two facts, it's not that we're heartless. This has been a great day of ministry, but here's their assumption. We need to send the crowds away so that they can go get food. And Jesus hears their assumption and challenges it. He says, no, they do not have to go away. And then he gives a new solution. You give them something to eat. Now, can you imagine being the disciples going, us, are you, what, how? You know, and they're just, their minds going, logically, this is impossible. Thousands of people, we have no food. What are we going to do? Jesus is testing their faith right now. Are you just testing it? See, chapter 13, the chapter before, Jesus had given about seven parables teaching them about how to have faith in God. It was the, the lecture. And then chapter 14 is the exam. It's the test. You're going to believe me or not? And, and when they say, they all got to go away, Jesus and answers with the phrase, I've just been meditating on this, they need not go away. They do not have to go away. Charles Spurgeon, who's the, the famous British preacher from the 1800s, had a whole sermon that he devoted just to that phrase, they need not go away. And the more that I've uh, thought about it, the more profound that phrase becomes. Because here's the takeaway. With God, our assumptions that we have about people, the statistics and stereotypes that we have in life, they don't have to become reality. Why? Because our God can do the impossible. Our stereotypes, statistics, assumptions don't have to become reality because our God can do the impossible. I thought about my dad, who I've talked about him a lot. But my dad grew up uh, in a family with no dad. Uh, my dad's dad died in a car accident when he was a couple months old. So my dad, he was the youngest of four kids. His mom never remarried. Grew up in a single parent household like many of you. And, you know, it didn't hit me until later in life some of the statistics that come out about kids that are raised in a home with no dad. In fact, I looked them up this week from the National Fatherhood Initiative. It said that those who have an absent father uh, are in greater risk of growing up in poverty. They're more likely to commit a crime and go to prison. They're more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. They're more likely to suffer obesity, to drop out of school. They're more likely to get a divorce and then become an absent father themselves. And those are the statistics many of us know. That is a way that those who grow up without a dad can go. And then I thought about how my dad has raised us. So there was a way he could have gone. And it was as though God said, no, you're going to go my way. You're going to go my way. Well, my dad been married to my mom, been faithful to her for over 30 years. That he raised five kids who are very imperfect but are walking with Jesus that he finished school and actually got his MBA, that he uh, works out every day. I still throw up when I go home and work out with him, you know, and uh, hasn't been to prison as far as I know. I mean, just a different direction that he went. And, and yet I think for many of us, sometimes we, we get in our minds some of those assumptions of just the way that things have to go. And yet God goes, no, that's a way, but I have my way and it's a different way. I can do the impossible. So table talk number three, 
Where have you had assumptions about people or about yourself in your life? And where is God graciously calling you to break out of those assumptions this morning? I thought about some of us, maybe some of you have a, a neighbor who you live next to who's just a grouch, just a grumpy old man, right? And you did the thing when you moved in, you brought over cookies or you invited him to the potluck or whatever, and just, argh, just mad. And uh, just didn't, doesn't want anything to do with you, mad because your kids go on his grass, just the whole thing. And, uh, and you've just wrote, written him off. In fact, it's better for you to just go, he's just a grouch, we just whatever. And maybe... God is inviting you to go, no, that's a way that it could go with you and your neighbor, but maybe I'm doing something different. And maybe I'm calling you to keep loving that guy and keep reaching out to that guy. And maybe in one of your three meals that you have with someone outside your circle, you invite that guy over to your house. And he may say no, but maybe God has a different way, maybe. You know, for some of you, it's that coworker that's, that you have that uh, never smiles, never talks. They're just quiet. They just do their job, and they don't want you to annoy them. And so you're good with that. All right, you do your thing. You stay in your lane. I'll stay in mine. And yet maybe God's saying, "Mm, I want you to love them. I want you to smile at them. I want you to invite them to lunch. You're like, ah, it's just so awkward, and they're so different than me. And, And yet God's saying, no, I want you to love on them. You know, maybe it's your view of the next generation, You see the next generation that's all on their phones, just addicted to social media, and you just go, they're all addicted. They're all obsessed. They're all going a certain way. And yet, maybe you'd start praying that God would raise up a remnant among the next generation where you go, yes, they may all go a certain way, but God's raising up some that will not go that way. And what if the next revival that breaks out of our country comes in the next generation? Because of your prayers, not writing them off, not being frustrated because they're always on their phone when you pass them in the car. But instead, you love them and and praying, God, raise up a remnant. Maybe it's the generational sin in your family that some of you go, man, every single person in my family has struggled with alcoholism. And so it's just going to be a thing. And and yet maybe God says, no, it's not. I'm going to break that generational tie with you. Now, maybe some of you, when you got married, you had that conversation with your spouse where you're like, hey, you just need to know my family's crazy, okay, so you're entering into that, and I'm going to be a little crazy too, and we're going to be crazy. And you go, no, you can break off that drama and go, yes, this is how my family is. We always talk bad about each other, and we just dog, but it's going to be different here. That's a way, but we're going to go a different way. We're going to go God's way. I just think that phrase that Jesus gives, it's almost throwaway when we read it, but it's profound. Disciples, they don't have to go away. I'm going to work through my own way. Jesus challenges their assumptions that they have about people and about themselves. Jesus empathizes with people. Jesus challenges assumptions. And then number three, the third thing we see Jesus do is Jesus multiplies what we only have. Jesus multiplies what we only have. Let's read the rest. We're going to start in verse 17. It says, Then they, the disciples, said to Jesus, We have only, or we only have, five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then Jesus ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said, A a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So the disciples come up to Jesus and they say, We only have five loaves and two fish. And we actually learn in John chapter 6 that this wasn't even theirs. They took it from a little boy who, had, who brought the five loaves and two fish. And yet Jesus looks at that and he says, I can do that. I can work with that. And Jesus takes it and he blesses it and he has everyone sit down. And then he breaks the bread, which is kind of a nod to the Lord's Supper. And then he begins to pass it out. And as he passes it out, it begins to multiply. And we learn that these thousands of people, 5,000 men, but it was probably more like 
15 to 20,000 people with women and children not only eat, but they're satisfied, they're full based on the multiplication that happens as Jesus spreads this out. And not only that, but there's 12 baskets full left over after. Here's the takeaway. Jesus can use what we only have, no matter how small it is. He can use it. No matter how small the offering is, he can use it. When we trust Jesus with our simple obedience, he can multiply that. I thought about in 2020, uh, I was living up in Tennessee and I was a youth pastor. And uh, I was so excited because we, I had worked it out with this uh, guy named Matthew, who's a college student at uh, Texas A&M, so he's a good dude. Uh, and uh, he was going to be our intern for the year. And I was, we were going to pay him. It was going to be great. And then pandemic hits, and our church cuts all discretionary spending and says, we're not paying for interns. And I'm like, ah, oh, no. So I have to go back to him and say, hey, man, we can't pay you. But Jen, my wife, and I had talked, and we just said, all right, so we can't pay him, but we got this little house, and we got an extra room. We got this 10-month-old baby that we're still figuring out how to, you know, keep her alive. But if he wants, he can come and live with us. And we were living kind of paycheck to paycheck at the time, so it was going to be a financial cost, but we just thought, all right, we'll just offer. So I call him up, say, hey, man, bad news, we can't pay you anything over the summer. But if you still want to come, you can live with us for free. If you're, if you're down to live with an eight-month-old. And he said, I'm in. Let's do it. And so we hung up the phone and kind of with fear and trepidation, we're like, all right, let's do it. And he comes up and I, I look back on that summer as one of the most transformative summers, not only of my life, but of that student ministry. Matthew, this guy came in and it just exploded. And in the midst of pandemic, we're hanging out outside, doing stuff on a farm. We're just having a blast. And our student ministry changed. Not only that, Matthew went back to college and met a girl. And they got married. And he invited me to actually perform the wedding, which I got to marry them, which was amazing. Then he moved. He and his wife moved up to Tennessee. And we got to do life with them. And then now he's a youth pastor in the Dallas area. And he invited me up a couple months ago to speak at his uh, youth event. And just, this, just yesterday, I was on the phone with him for a few hours, just, just catching up, and he's one of my closest friends. And I just think, wow, you know, what, what seemed like such a negative, we can't pay you, ended up turning out to this opportunity for me to offer, Jen and I, to offer a simple obedience of this is all we have, and yet if you're willing, then uh, here's what we've got. And God ended up using that beyond what I could have ever dreamed, multiplying it in my life and his so what, what do you only have right now that God may be wanting to multiply for his purposes? Table talk number four. When was a time, ask this in your group, when was a time when you sacrificed something that you only had out of simple obedience? And what happened with that? Is there anything that you only have right now that God may be wanting to multiply for his purposes? You know, I thought oftentimes we'll flip this phrase. So I only have, but I will be obedient. We'll flip it and use it as an excuse. If I only had, then I would obey. How many of us have done that? If I only had more money, then I could provide meals for other people to come over to my house. Then I, then I would. Maybe one day when I have more money. And God's saying, no, no. What if you said, I only have enough money to invite one person over? But, but out of obedience, I'm going to do it, and we're going to eat pizza. <laughs> you know? uh, maybe your excuse is, uh, you know, if I only had a bigger house, if I only had a bigger house, then I would have people living with me. And yet maybe some of us would say, man, I only have a little house with a little room, but I can let one person come and stay who's in need of a place. You know, maybe you would say, if I only had more knowledge, then I would be a small group leader or serve with the high school ministry or junior high. Or, but I, I, I only have a little knowledge. So maybe I, I only have a little, but I'm willing and I'll step in. You know, maybe some of you would say, and, and relating even to this series, some of you, your lives are so crazy. And you go, if I only had a little more margin in my, in my life, a little more time, if, if only the, the kids weren't doing so many activities, then we, we would sit down and actually have a meal together. And yet maybe God's inviting you to say, hey, I only have 20 minutes. And it's late. 
But in that 20 minutes, I'm going to gather up the family. And we're going to sit down together. You know, maybe you'd say, I, if I only had more energy or more strength or, more, or better health, then I would serve God. Then I would worship. And yet some of you, many of you who I know in, in here right now have said, I only have a little energy and I only have a little strength, but I will worship right now. See, God loves only half. God uses only half. God multiplies only half in ways you won't be able to see until heaven. Some of you with the little strength that you have lifting your hands in worship ministers to someone sitting behind you you don't even know and you won't know until glory. And yet God's using it. Some of you, the ways you've provided for people, it's, all, it's so little, it's so meaningless to you. But in heaven's economy, God's using it for his purposes. Do, will you trust Jesus with the simple obedience in your life? Because he can multiply whatever that thing is. He can. We see Jesus empathize with people. We see Jesus challenge assumptions. We see Jesus multiply what we only have. And all three of these things are amazing principles that we get from this text. Jesus is just amazing. And yet there's something under this parable that I think is roaring or under this uh, uh, miracle that's roaring if we zoom out and we look at it. And it's the conclusion that I want to spend the rest of our time with, and it's this. It's that Jesus restores our soul. Jesus restores our soul. We kind of flew over it, but in Matthew chapter 14, verse 19, the first half, Jesus does something really unique. That again, we, we normally just fly over it, but think about it. Matthew 14, 19 says, Then he, Jesus, ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Jesus ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And it hit me, you know, when I read that, Jesus didn't have to make them sit down. Jesus could, I don't know if you've ever been in a potluck where there's a bunch of people around, there's grilling, there's a, a lot serving line, people are standing up, talking, watching TV, you're just kind of mingling. And, and yet Jesus stopped everything and he said, no, everybody sit down. He didn't just encourage it, he ordered it. And I think this was on purpose. I think Jesus had in mind what David wrote in Psalm 23 that many of us know. Think about what David wrote. David says, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, and then it ends, he restores my soul. See, Jesus is not just going, all right, disciples, you ready? I'm going to blow their minds, and I'm going, to feed, I'm going to feed this whole thing, and everyone's going to go crazy. He's going, no, no. Yes, that's going to happen, but even more than that, I, I, I don't just want to feed them for a few hours and restore them physically. I want to restore their soul. I want to be their good shepherd, and I want to do what no other human being can do. I want to restore their soul. I don't want this just to be a transactional meal. I want this to be a transformational meal moment. You know, I thought about when we sit around the table with our families, and uh, some of us, we, we just read the statistic, in, if you've been here the past couple of weeks, Jim has mentioned that only 30% of families in America sit down and eat together regularly. And some of you grew up in families where you did this regularly, others of you didn't, but in my small group last week, we just went around and said, hey, how many of you was this actually a regular thing? And about half and half. And for the people where it wasn't, there was all kinds of pragmatic reasons why they didn't. Man, we were a real sporty family. We were always out and about. You know, practice was late or we were going here or driving across town. And so we just kind of grabbed something on the way. Others, it was, hey, we loved watching our reality TV shows or watching sports. And so we'd gather up in the living room and that's where we would do it. Other people, it was just mom would make hamburger helper and put it on the stove, and then whenever we'd come home, we'd heat it up and then go to our rooms. And we all just kind of did our own thing. And each person looks back, and, and they're saying, hey, it was pragmatic, it made sense. But every one of them looked back with some regret. Like, you know, we missed out. Yes, we had a meal, but we missed out on a moment together. 
Yeah, yeah, we were nourished, but we missed that relational component. And it's interesting. What Jesus is doing in the feeding of the 5,000 is he doesn't want them to miss the moment. He's not just going, I'm going to blow your mind. Everybody form a line and then boom, you're good. Go tell everyone about what I did. He's going, no, no, we're going to have a moment together. And we're going to celebrate together. I want you to sit down, relax, and I'm going to nourish you for a few hours, but I'm going to restore your soul for those who are willing for eternity. That's what Jesus is after. Jesus is not just trying to nourish them uh, with good principles. He wants to restore them with his presence. He wants to commune with them. And later, a few chapters later, Jesus will make a way for that to happen. Just like the song that we sang, it is finished. Through Christ's death and resurrection, he's going to make a way such that Hebrews 10 says, we can have confidence to enter the holy places, to enter the presence of God because of the blood shed of Jesus on our behalf. And now we can watch and we can wonder in God's timing and in his way because of what he has done. And so table talk number five, as we think about our own families, it would be great to ask, did your family sit down and eat together at the table growing up? What was that like? What was normal mealtime, dinner time like in your family? And what, if anything, would you want to change with your own family? Uh, and then how is God inviting you as we finish up our time this morning? How is God inviting you? What is he pressing on you this morning that he wants you to leave and not just go, oh, that was cool, that was good, and, and, but instead go, okay, this is what God's doing in me. And so as we conclude, this prayer altar is open, and uh, we're going to enter into about five to ten minutes of just time to pray and time to worship. And, uh, you know, I've been standing back there the past couple of weeks and just watching at the end of the service. It's normal. We just rush out, go grab our kids, try to beat the traffic. And I just want to do what Jesus did in the feeding of the 5,000 and say, let's not do that for a second. Let's wait as we take some time to pray and let's let Jesus restore our soul. Let's sit down and not get up. And just for five minutes, 10 minutes, ask ourselves some questions. What is it, God, that you're doing in me? You know, maybe it's, as you hear this, you would say, man, I need to repent of not leading my family well in gathering around the table. I've let pragmatism win. And it's not wrong to run to practices, to watch a show, to do any of that. But if, if our meal times become just about the meal and we miss the moment, we're, we're, we're gonna regret it. And maybe God's saying, oh, let's repent, let's do something different. Uh, maybe you need to pray about how to turn interruption into invitation in your life. The very people that are frustrating you because they interrupt, interrupt, how can you invite them in? Uh, maybe you've walked into this room with pain and you're enduring this service, but you've got pain in your mental health or physical or with a relational pain or something with your kids. And Jesus empathizes with that pain. He says in Matthew 11, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I promise I will give you rest. Maybe you're here this morning because you're supposed to bring that to the prayer altar and say, God, I just bring this to you again and again and again and again and again. But today, I'm going to bring this offering to you again. Uh, maybe it's you need Jesus to restore your soul. That you need, you're, you're tired and exhausted and you need the rest that's found in him. Maybe God's calling some of you to lay Isaac on the altar to put the thing, whether it's, it was football for me my senior year, or someone that you fear more than God in your life, or some dream that your, your family's being destroyed as you try to uphold this dream, as you try to chase this in your life. And God is saying, are you willing to put that thing on the altar to fear me more than that boss, more than that person, more than that career? Are you willing to sacrifice it? And maybe you're supposed to come up to this altar and go, God, whether you take it away or not, you're my God, not this thing. And maybe that's why God has you here today. Maybe some of you, you're actually here this morning because God's saying it's time to cross over the line. It's time to become a Christian. Like no more playing the game, 
No more just, just saying the talk, okay, honey, I'll, I'll, I'll whatever. It's I'm in. I am in. I am all in. In fact, we're about to do 25 baptisms right after this service, right out there. And some of you, if you want to stay and celebrate, some of you, though, you didn't bring a change of clothes. It doesn't matter. You're going, I got to get in that water. I, I got to tell everyone, I'm in. I'm in. And maybe you would even get baptized this afternoon. What is it for you? We're going to spend the next five minutes just praying. Allow God to speak to you. The prayer altar is open. If you want someone to, sp- someone to speak to you, cup your hands. Otherwise, we'll leave you alone. Father, we commit our lives to you. We love you. Feed the 5,000 in our lives. Do whatever you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you come and pray? This altar is open.
about you, but I think God has redeemed April the 14th. <laughs> yeah, he has. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tyler's going to be hanging out here at the front if anybody wants to visit with him. If you're a guest this morning, Tyler would love to shake your hand. He'll be right up here afterwards. Uh, on the second last page of your worship guide, you'll see about National Day of Prayers coming up. Every year, we gather with other churches to pray for our city and nation that's Thursday, May the 2nd at 7 p.m. This year, uh, we're having it at the Fellowship Church, and uh, I'd love it if we'd all show up for that. More information on that uh, worship guide. Would you receive uh, this benediction? May the Lord restore your soul. May the Lord grant you his compassion, that you would feel his compassion. He understands. May the Lord grant you grace to turn interruptions into invitations. May the Lord shatter assumptions and turn them into multiplied miracles. May the Lord take what you only have and multiply it for his purposes and his glory and your good. May the Lord grant you to sit down in green pastures God bless. Have a great week. Baptisms in about 10 minutes.
peace there is a grace that covers me there is a king there is a throne there is a man who bled for me 